Welcome back, everybody, to the Party Pace podcast, and we've got a fun show for you today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, whether or not some brands are over or underrated, and I'm not going to do it alone. I'm going to do it with fellow bike YouTuber Nolan from The Bike Sauce. How's it going, Nolan? <laughs> Doing pretty good. Pretty excited to, to be here. Should be fun. Cool. And I'm sure some people are wondering, hey, that's an awful lot like the, the Cade Media segment and it is <laughs> but i thought we could do it like from a different slightly different perspective like from the non like british roadie perspective right <laughs> i think it's a good i think it's a good plan yeah uh, so i think the format of the show uh constantly experimenting is that we're going to talk about three interesting drops or articles and then and then we'll get into the over or underrated uh section so uh, we see some people in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, so first off, I sent you something. You, did you get a chance to to read these articles? Hopefully, <laughs> I did. Yeah, I looked at all of them. <laughs> okay, so but let's talk about um, this first one. This is probably the one. You know, there's a lot of uh, product and component drops, and this one I'm actually pretty uh, excited about. It's a new MicroShift Sword. Um, do you have any, did you get, what do you think of this, Nolan? Uh, when I read it, the first thing that comes to me, it looks like S word, first of all, um, <laughs> my, my micro shift S word, um, Microsoft. Yeah. Sword. I, I think it's going to be awesome because the thing that I didn't like about the previous generation micro shift is the, the drop bar shifters were just really bulbous. Mm -hmm. and they were, just weren't that er ergonomic. And so if you look at the, the new sword, uh, drop bar shifters clearly it's like i mean it's it's grx right it's it's basically it looks yeah. like Germano's grx and i think that's a good thing i think like a budget version of something like a shimano grx is just it's going to do really well yeah and something with uh for for the people that still use cable actuated disc brakes um yeah i think this will be definitely a hot pick um it's fortunate to get my hands on one and you're right. It totally reminds me of like the Shimano levers, very like angular and, and sleek. Um, one thing I really enjoyed about it is the, the actual feel of the the big uh, brake lever. It's got this like matte blasted satiny feel, uh, which is pretty nice. Just um, like GRX. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the funny the funny thing is, uh, so they you know I'm installing this on the bike. I'm putting on the the, the Monet uh, Money Hachita. And I have it set up uh, friction shifting for now with down tube shifters because the bike has uh, down tube bosses and I don't have a cable stop. So I have to order one of those from uh, from Uncle Jeff. <laughs> okay. So you haven't <laughs> shifted on the sword yet? Uh, no, I've braked with the sword. I've just not used the, the, the shifting mechanism of the brake oh. levers. <laughs> That's, That's um, funny. Yeah, I can tell you the the braking feels good. Um, if you look at like the pivot bolt, it's moved. It when you know I compared it to like some long pull, um, like Tektro levers, and it's kind of in the same spot. So okay. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um. I'll oh, see. This article says they look like Shimano too. Yeah, that's yeah. the first thing that stood out to me. But I think that's a good thing. I think because as soon as you as soon as you move the pivot up higher, you just have that extra leverage, and it doesn't. It's just not as hard and awkward to to grab the brake lever. Yeah, yeah. When I was using it, and since I'm using it for friction, the the first thought I that came to mind was, "Geez, you know, I hope they come out with just like just uh, non integrated brake levers for for people that want to use bar ends or something because they do feel that good. They're like the the best feeling non Shimano or or SRAM brake levers that that I've used so far. Oh, that's interesting. So just um, like a straight ahead drop bar brake lever. Yeah, yeah. First bike weirdos. Um, another interesting thing that I I thought about this was that uh, the rear derailleur supposedly uses the same body but a different cage. Whether you're running one by or two by, um, mm. right? So you can just swap the cage if you want more range. Yeah, if you look at the, here's a good picture of it. Hopefully it's coming up. Uh, but yeah, there's three bolts on the back, so you can, you know, undo this. Um, I did try using the one by a rear derailleur on a two by setup, 
And I can confirm it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which we, I, I thought it would work because it didn't look like it had that high offset pulley design of most one one by derailers. I thought the only difference was like the cage length, but something else is oh. going on. It just wasn't taking up the slack. Hmm. Um, let's see. The cranks. Um, I keep bringing up GRX, but like the cranks look just like the GRX cranks too. They do. They're very very similar. Um, What's uh? I don't know if there's a picture of the cranks here. Let's see. Ah, here they are. Yeah. yeah. Right, because you got that asymmetrical bolt pattern. I think it's the same BCD as even as the Shimano cranks. Yeah, you know. So they um, they sent over a forty-two tooth one by, and for me, like forty-two tooth is just like way too big. So I have a GRX crank with a Wolf tooth, a thirty-eight tooth uh, chain mm -hmm. ring, and I thought I could swap it over. The BCDs are exactly the same, but if you if you look at the back, you can't see it in this picture. Like the way the tabs sit on the arms is just different enough that it's not a one to one swap. You'd have to take a a file and grind away some of the the the, the tab on the sword um, or on the uh, GRX chain rings, which is a bummer. Oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, I've already, I, like, I've, I've already done all sorts of weird hacky shit to it that you're not, <laughs> that you probably weren't expecting. Well, I would, I like looking at the, I was thinking of you when I was looking at the, the gear offerings because they are very reasonable. Like, they're much lower than your typical kind of racy gravel spec, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty good. You know, and they say the capacity is going to be 38 tooth, which is means that you can probably, you know, force a 40 in there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but hopefully, like this is um, so this is a uh, the back view of the one by crank, and it has even though it's shipped with one chain ring, it's got a second set of the BCDs. I think it's one ten, and then ninety is the internal one. But you see, like the tab of the chain ring, like this, it's incompatible with the a oh. GRX um, chain ring. So yeah. with, without taking like an angle grinder to it or something. <laughs> Um, well, that's part of the fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that would make a good YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you've, you've played with the older Advent Techs, right? Yeah, yeah. The braking, I mean, braking is pretty notorious for being, you know, pretty, pretty rough out of the box. So I think one of the Poseidon bike videos I did was just. The whole video was just converting to compressionless brake housing and how, you know, how big of a difference that made. Are you yeah. finding with the stock sword, like how's the braking without compressionless? Uh, I feel like it's actually pretty good. And it might be because of how, how they shifted the, the, the pivot point. Yeah. Um, better leverage. Yeah. So yeah, hmm. I didn't put any like baller brake cable and it was, it was breaking surprisingly well. Um, I'm using a, a the, the bike has disc brakes on the front and a, a cantilever on the rear, and it's <laughs> it's nice. <fine. laughs> um, let's see. Uh, so Jared asks, when is the sword group coming out? Do you remember? Do you know what day? That, I feel like they've sent out some samples. Yeah, like I didn't get one, but you got one, <laughs> so it's pretty soon, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it I, sounds like it, it's going to be OEM on um, some bikes. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I don't actually know the, the release date. Yeah. Let's see. All right. So the the next topic, um, which one do you want to talk about first the or next? The, the Van Moof or the, the tour? <laughs> <laughs> the Van Moof one is it's just fun. Like, it's, I shouldn't laugh, but it's funny. <laughs> So we can talk that one next. Yeah. Do you want to uh, just tee it up for people? <laughs> uh, yeah. Russ sent over this article. Like, first of all, you have to commend um, the Netherlands just for their bike infrastructure. Right? There's bikes everywhere over there. But I guess this Van Moof company, who's a Dutch-owned company, is I think they're filing for bankruptcy, um, which also means that their servers are going to go down pretty soon, which also means that everyone who owns one of these bikes is going to get locked out of their bike. <laughs> And it's basically just going to become a brick. Right. <laughs> so it's just comical because the subtext is 
you know, Russ is so anti bike tech and this is just kind of like a, the epitome of what can go wrong <laughs> when you try and like shove too much tech into a bike. Yeah. And like Van Moof, it's not like a fly by night company. I feel like, you know, when we were living in Portland, we'd see them around town. So like super well-established. Right. Um, I saw somewhere on the, the Twitters, I think it was bike hugger, but he said that, I don't know if it was Van Moof or like rad power that they just, burnt through like a ton of money, like in the magnitude of like $500 million or something, which is oh. bananas. <laughs> so yeah, what's the, I mean, the solution is, it's not even really a solution. It's like a hack, right? There's like a third com- third party app who's somehow going to like get the users access to their, <laughs> their like <laughs> software. Their <bike>. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, again, I shouldn't, yeah, I, I shouldn't laugh, but it's, this is a very like Russ moment of like, hi, I told you so. <laughs> like, too much tech is bad. I just, I didn't realize how integrated it was. Like, you can like start the bike or, you know, you can then shift. Um, you know, I, I brought this up in the Discord and, um, you know, some people caught the subtext I was getting at, like whether or not like this would trickle into things like DI2 or electronic shifting. Um, right. And it's, to be clear, it's not like that now, but there's certainly more of a groundwork for that potentially to happen. Like if, if things become so integrated um, to, to apps, basically. Yeah. Right, right. Um, have you, have, do you have the electronic shifting on, on your current, in your current fleet? Yeah, I have one bike. Um, I have the, um, I have the Polygon road bike with the, uh, di2 105 which um i'm i'm reviewing currently um that's the only bike that i've got electronic shifting on and i actually like it i mean it's electronic but at least it's not like you know integrated like fully integrated into your phone or something you know yeah how did you have did you even have to use an app or was it just like i could have but i've resisted so far i just want to see how it is out of the box um i'm just really reluctant to like pair my phone to the bike (laughs) (laughs) Um, there was one video yeah go ahead yeah what you're saying (laughs) yeah i I did a review um on you know you get emails from from companies and and one review i took was this um oh i forgot the company somebody can remind us hopefully in the comments it was this e-bike but it was like super packed with tech you know it was like an e-bike for silicon valley you know (laughs) techies or something and um it's got like a thumbprint you had like a thumbprint scanner just to like unlock the bike and just right out of the box. I, I couldn't get the thumbprint to work. So I had to like download the app and I just, I don't want to be updating firmware on my bikes. Right. <laughs> just, um, recently this company Velotrix sent over a bike. They gave me a choice. I could have like the basic bike or like their flagship model with all the integration. So I just said, I don't want that. I just want the basic bike to kind of see how it, how it rides. So yeah i I guess some people are all about it um i just don't see the benefit really yeah i'm curious like if someone's trying to you know since ai is so hot right now if someone's like trying to work away work ai into the bike into like the shifting or something like it learns your your cadence and your preferred like gear range so it just automatically shifts for you uh that that's what this van move has it said um i think in the article it said they had automatic shifting uh, ah so this third party company, they'll get you basic access to your bike, but not like full access, which means, <laughs> I don't know, maybe the automatic transmission isn't going to shift for you. Right. God, God forbid you have to push a button to, <laughs> to, to shift the gears. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, you guys in the, the chat, what do you guys think of app integration with bikes? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Am I being an old curmudgeon? Um, or... You know, is it, are we inviting Skynet <laughs> into our yeah. bike? <laughs> yeah, that's my buddy Brian in the chat. He mentioned the Utopia. What's that? Utopia. That, that, that was a bike, yeah. Okay. So I think it stands for Urban Utopia. It yeah. just mushed it together <laughs> into one. Self, self-riding self bikes are, in, that's true. <laughs> one day. <laughs> um, okay, some, some voices of reason, Joel V., uh, just saying there that to app integration. Um, 
Yeah. Um, well, cool. Let's talk about the last article that I uh, brought up here. Where'd it go? Um, this one's from Bicycle re Retailer. It's kind of the the industry uh, newsletter or I don't know, magazine, I guess it's printed. And it's talking about the interesting dynamics of um, you know, sponsorship and the Tour de France. Um, did you watch any of the tour this year, Nolan, or... I tried. I tried really hard. I even, I even subscribed to Peacock since we don't have like cable service, and I watched some of it. Maybe the first three or four stages, and then I started watching highlights only, and then I kind of <laughs> tapered off. <laughs> yeah, when I used to be really into it, there would be like the twenty-minute like highlight of like the last twenty minutes of the race, and then there's like the five-minute condensed version. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd put it actually. I'd, I would. I'd start to put the the race on. And then I would just kind of fast forward through it, you know, hours at a time so that I'd end up watching it for like 10, 15 minutes and then watch the last, watch the finish line, basically. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like sports go. It's, it's kind of strange, right? Because the team names are just random product companies. Like it could be like a shampoo company. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the riders are constantly switching. There's no like numbers. Like you don't like, I, it's like really hard to, to root for, a team that's named after like a caffeine, like a, a shampoo with caffeine in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think with the tour, it's all about the riders, right? Like people follow the riders and people have their favorites and it's almost the team. Well, I don't know. Maybe I, I can't speak for it, but the team is maybe less important than the, than the riders themselves. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this article in a bicycle retailer talks about some of the the strange economics of sponsoring a team in the Tour de France. Apparently, um, you know, base number ten years ago was like a million bucks just to get your foot in the door in terms of uh, providing any kind of level of sponsorship to a team on the tour, and that's not even like title sponsorship. That's just you know, just entering that that market. Um, and he makes some kind of interesting points. One of them is that, uh, let's see if I can highlight, highlight it here. Uh, in no way do sales of high-end road bikes pay for the cost of road team sponsorship. <laughs> um, I thought that was fast, fascinating. Like, you know, where they're, they're drawing the money to participate as a, a sponsor in the tour. It's, it's taking from like other parts of uh, a bike company. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. I, isn't the title of this live stream is the Tour de France overrated? <laughs> <laughs> That's <Definitely>. true. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's overrated in terms of what you get for sponsorship dollar. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah it was kinda... I think this article starts with, um, is it this article or something else I was reading? Like the, the whole prime, like the, the article starts with, Okay, it's Tour de France season, um, and it's like from the point of view of a, of a bike shop owner. Mm -hmm. But the whole point is that like none of his customers watch the tour, so like so who really cares, I guess. And I don't think the Tour de France is overrated necessarily. There's like you know a huge following, and people are very passionate about it. But I think the problem with maybe maybe some of the problem with it is that it puts racing up on this pedestal, and it feels like you know, all the cycling companies, like if you go buy the, the flagship road bike from any company, it's, it's just almost unrideable. Like I can't sit in that position for more right. than 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> the, the gearing is just so tall. Like I, what you, uh, your, your term is aspirational. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like put it in the hardest gear and see, see if you could even turn the cranks. Like I can't, so, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's interesting. Like they talk about, um, you know, what, what, you know, a title sponsor has to do, you know, in terms of like a bike brand, you know, it not only is that the, ca the cash outlay up front, but also, you know, all the bikes that you have to provide to the riders and, you know, all the support and what have you. Um, and, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Like there's not like a direct, like a route from, 
selling bikes to, you know, we generate enough money to, to sponsor the tour. And one of the biggest reasons um, companies even do do this, uh, according to, to Vosper, is a uh, corporate positioning. So it's like brand FOMO. Like if they're not at the tour, then they're going to see be seen as a lesser brand. So it's like this, you know, it may not make financial sense, but if, you know, we're, we're not there, if we're not visible, then we lose like value, you know, to, across the board to, in the cycling industry. Right. Yeah. That's, that's upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> that, just, that seems like a weird reason to do it though. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you caught the Netflix the Tour de France, like docu-series. Did you watch that one? I haven't. Is it is it any good? I mean, I thought it was good. Just otherwise, I would never be exposed to that kind of you know information. But they, you know, a, a couple of episodes kind of touch on that briefly. Like some of the motivation for winning points in the race was just to like preserve their relationship with their sponsors so they can continue to to race. And I mean, yeah. it was you know, it was interesting. It was kind of like they adopted a, a drive to survive kind of format. Um, so it was pretty engaging. Yeah. I, I learned a little bit about it. <laughs> there was a, they did another Tour de France series a couple of years ago. I think they followed like movie star. Oh. Um, I want, you know, again, you know, I, it, there was a time when I, when they watched uh, a lot of the grand tours less so these days, but you know, it's hard to, to be in the bike industry or, or do bike media and not be somehow affected by um, by yeah. the segment of, of cycling that actually surprises me that you used to watch pro cycling yeah and you know like i part of me felt like i had to do it this is when we were living in in portland and like the thing to do was you know july comes around everyone would would go to velo cult back when it was still there it was this awesome bike shop and bar and it had the tour on and it was like a great right. place to hang out with with bike nerds um oh, that's good. Yeah, but I, I do have to. Admit, it was kind of like an acquired taste, like smoking. Like it makes no sense <laughs> when you first start to watch it. Like, why is this exciting? But it's not like you said to your point. It's not until you, you know, find a writer that you like that you know that you can relate to in some some weird way that be it becomes interesting. Right. Yeah. Did you who who are your? Did you have any favorite writers of? Um. I think um, Van Art, Woot Van Art is is maybe just I just like him because he's so strong, but he's just there to support his team. You know, he's a team player and not yeah. just there for all the glory. <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest, I I don't even know that many. I probably know less than ten writers that I can you know name. So yeah, <laughs> I was a big I was a big Nairo uh, Quintana fan when he hit the scene. Just because he was like, you know, a very small stature, very stoic, but he could climb like a goat. And like his first, his first two seasons, um, you know, like really surprised people. Uh, but then once, once like the expectations for him to be like a GC rider, you know, I feel, I feel like he kind of crumbled under the pressure. Mm. Um, let's see. So Michael Mann's big, big fan. He says, if professional cycling confuses you and you want to understand that Netflix series uh, is a fascinating tutorial. That's for sure. That's uh, how I felt about F1. And then, you know, obviously that kind of swept <laughs> nation. <laughs> so are you, are you an F, are you an F1 really? I, yeah, I, I enjoy it. Yeah. How'd um, you get into it? Well, see, that's the problem. I got into it because of the Netflix. Thing, so ah. I guess I'm a bandwagon fan. There you go. <laughs> but, it's That's okay. Fine. My 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 interest in chess got peaked by Queen's Gambit. It's a thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. All right. We've got 155 people in the chat. If you guys have any uh, comments on those three articles, let us know. And we will get to our main event. Are these brands over or underrated? Um, I think we we've got a list here. Um. And they're not all brands. Some of them are just like things. <laughs> right. Um, you want to kick it off? Microshift <laughs> in general. Over overrated or underrated? I think it's underrated. Um, yeah. I feel like they provide a lot of uh, 
they, they, pri- pr- pr- they provide a lot of and a value for the dollar. Uh, they're yeah. not like the sexiest brand, although I do think like Sword is going to probably change some minds because it does look so like GRX-y. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, Microshift is, um, I learned about them when I started looking at the Poseidon bikes. And Poseidon uses Microshift on everything from um, their flat bar stuff to their drop bar stuff. And everything's compatible. Everything works really well. The shifting is dialed. The braking is, you know, is okay. <laughs> but I, I think probably sounds like they've addressed braking a little bit. Yeah, I think the braking is actually really good uh, now, like with the with the new lovers. So yeah, and for the money, like, ah, man, it's just I have a couple of extra micro shift like drivetrains, just like because just I yeah, might need them, <laughs> <laughs> like inner tubes. You know, just have a couple extra because they're affordable and they're available. So. Yeah, I probably have uh, four or five like micro shift bar in shifters. <laughs> Yeah, just for different uh, YouTube projects. So they, I definitely, the uh, Microshift definitely has a, a soft spot in my heart, just um, because of the bar ends, but also like even their more more modern stuff is providing good value. Yeah. Um, all right, next brand. Um, or I'm curious uh, in in the chat, do you guys think Microshift is over or underrated? Um, <laughs> Omar, hard to look at the Microshift group sets. Wait, wait until you see Sword. Sword's like a, I think it's going to be a, a game changer for the brand. Um, what else is there? Underrated, especially since they stepped in for OEM brands when Shimano had a shortage. Um, yeah, I think um, you know Shimano launched Qs, which is stands for creating unique experiences. <laughs> When I, when I see that it um, this uh, I don't know if you're a Calvin and Hobbes fan, but but uh, if anyone out there is a Calvin and Hobbes fan, there's uh, you know Calvin's club that he has with with Hobbes, his stuffed tiger is called Gross. It stands for Get Rid of Slimy Girls, but the the S is the last letter in the acronym. <laughs> That's what Q's is. Yeah. <laughs> I think Sword is a much cooler name. If we're just going to go on the the coolness of the name alone, like Sword, like totally skewers cues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So Sean, your Microchef definitely underrated. Um, Benjamin put on ten thousand miles on Advent, so definitely underrated. I was surprised that like the their big uh, pie plate cassette, the the eleven uh, forty eight. Um, it's pretty lightweight, yes. you know, yeah. like the Sunrace one is like a chonker at like over a pound. And mm-hmm. I forget, I forget the exact grams of uh, the Advent one, but it's, it's competitive. Yeah. It's because there's not as many cogs. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Boxes, uh, box components. They're saying like nine is nine is fine. <laughs> nine is fine. Yeah. <laughs> I like the concept. Um, I think their their shifting is a little squishy, in my experience, but it works well and it's really affordable. Box or, or micro shift? Box. Box. Yeah. yeah, I liked I liked it. I mean, it, it worked really well up front, and then kind of slowly became a little bit squishier as the time went on. I had um, their second tier group set, the one without the adjustable clutch, and I I found like the shifting really really stiff on that one. Like it was gonna Fox, break my right? yeah, break my fingers off. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I noticed um too. And I feel like the did you were you the did you tell me that you spoke to them at Sea Otter and or someone spoke to them at Sea Otter and they, they said that like that's one of the things that they address in their, their second tier line is they kind of eased up on the, the clutch a little bit. No, not me. Yeah. I didn't see box at Sea Otter. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't talk to Box. Um, all right. So the next uh, brand that we're going <laughs> to pass judgment on <laughs> is Campagnolo. Campagnolo. Um, what do you guys think in the chat? Is Campagnolo overrated or underrated? <laughs> I'm actually curious to see what everyone says before. I know. Should we wait? <laughs> 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 I mean, wow. I yeah, 
Do you have any? Have you? Do you have any any campy currently? I, I don't. I've ridden campy. My one of my buddies, um, his you know he's all all about campy. I've serviced campy in the past. I'm, you know, I've looked at Ekar online. <laughs> um I, it's just like okay the bike industry like all of the bike in- industry is here and then like it's like campy is just this like exoplanet orbiting right? it's just in yeah. its own little <laughs> its own little face doing its own thing which is fine but it is it is expensive and it doesn't play well with with uh anything, with anything. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see what people are saying here uh <laughs> Erica, overpriced, so I can't <laughs> read it. Um, another one, Flying Kangaroo says over. Husky Op says way over. <laughs> Andrew Chase, way overrated. <laughs> okay, I don't feel bad about my opinion then. <laughs> I, I mean, I do appreciate like pushing the boundary into one by thirteen, but eventually, I you know, eventually Shimano will get there probably, and you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. The Ekar, like, Ekar looks really nice. I'll I'll say that, but that's about all all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, what's your what's your take on Campy? Are they over or under? Me? I yeah. they're I mean, they're in my opinion, they're they're a bit over overrated. Yeah, yeah. So, I concur. Like yeah. I do. You, do you have Ekar? Because I thought you were testing the uh, one. Yeah, I'm, I'm testing it like, with right. Ekar on it. And um, it's got 13 speeds. That's cool, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it's geared like way too high. That's been like a complaint of mine with, with Campy like forever. Like I don't know who who it's for. It's not for me. Um, I feel like they're really like out of touch out of out of touch of with like the general population, um, which is fine. I mean, they own it. You know, it's expensive and it's geared too high. It's not for everybody. Um, but yeah. I mean, it's okay. Like I feel like the the shifting with the thumb shifter is really like kerchunky, you know. Mm-hmm. Like it's like a, um, I don't know. <laughs> not, not, I'm not a fan. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. fair. Yeah. Um. So I think I think it's overrated. Let's see. Joel V. Campy now has the most expensive group set ever. Yes. <laughs> um, I did have uh, an Athena group set on the bike once. I think it was for on the Molten. Um, and there the big rings make sense because you have to make up the gear inches because of like the small wheels. Mm. But on a, you know, on a regular wheeled size bike, no. <laughs> Athena is their lower end. Like they're, they're, isn't that like their entry level? I think so. Yeah. 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 My, my uh, buddy had, um, chorus, I think a full chorus setup. It's nice. It's like class, classy, classic looking. Yeah. I feel like I could get the same performance from like 105. So. Yeah. Yeah. They've kind of, I don't know. They they just don't make sense to me. <laughs> I feel like they're one of those heritage brands that uh, people want them to stick around just because they're they've been so influential in the the bike yeah. industry. But right. they're they're, iconic, it's an iconic brand. Yeah, but they're kind of slowly becoming irrelevant. Sorry, I had to plug in my computer; it's starting to lose battery. <laughs> I like Damien's suggestion, Chris King. Uh, I wonder what people think about Chris King stuff. If you if you don't want to if you if you want to go off topic, <laughs> yeah, we can go there. Um, I don't know. What do you? <laughs> what's your feeling Chris, on Chris King? <laughs> Chris King stuff is expensive, but but I believe. Well, I believe it's justified because of um, just the amount of effort that they put into their products and and you do everything in house and it's you know all precision and i think i feel like the product is worth the dollars at least in in this case yeah i mean i can um, see why they're caught co- you know like we've we've toured their factory in portland you know mm-hmm. definitely not a, a cheap place to to do business um so it is yeah it is expensive 
Um, someone did say here. Um, <laughs> I don't know why anyone needs pairings that good in the headset. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris King has a brand in general, hubs, bottom brackets, you know. Yeah. Um, That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> a headset turns like six degrees at a time. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to make a confession here, but I usually try to get like the most inexpensive but not crappy headset. <laughs> I think. Usually that ends up being like a Cane Creek. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if I feel a baller, I'll go, go up to Wolf Tooth. But I've not I've not splashed out on a on the CK headset yet. <laughs> yeah. Part of it is like bling factor too, right? So I think Brian put it put it just right. He said it's, it's perfectly rated. It's just right. <laughs> it's right. Is optimal rating. <laughs> yeah, I yeah I'd probably be more interested in spending more on their hubs, but not so much their headset. Yeah, like I feel I, I feel like the the value in the headset is uh, doesn't do it for for me, but the hubs potentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um so hopefully no one from chris king is is watching the show because we're gonna go see, go see them in august <laughs> are you going to maid is that yeah are you gonna go oh. are you gonna go out there uh i got the the invitation but um kids are it's, i'm starting a semester a week before and the kids have, are in school so in, i'd like to there's a there's like a two percent chance i'll put it that way yeah well you should you should let us know if you if you go, it should be fun. Yeah, will do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've covered <laughs> uh, Microsoft, Campy, and Chris King. Um, the next thing is uh, alum aluminum bikes. Overrated uh, or underrated? Frame material. Yeah. I think this is um, this is a misnomer. This is going to be a flop because. <laughs> Aluminum, it's aluminum is not aluminum. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like how so? <laughs> cheap aluminum is is doesn't ride very well, right? But but I think aluminum has come a long way since you know the early two thousands. Um, so so probably I think by today's standards, I would consider it underrated just because it's got this stigma attached to it, but they've made a lot of, you know, a lot of progress in how an aluminum frame can feel. Yeah. Have you tested any recent modern aluminum bikes? Yes. Yeah. So I just recently went out to Blackheart um, okay. in, in Venice, California. I rode their aluminum all road. Um, they're a boutique, very small boutique company. They do titanium, everything but they've started offering an aluminum version and I rode both. I rode the titanium a couple of years ago. And then just recently I rode the aluminum. I was expecting just, you know, harsh jarring, but no, it, it rode really well. It was, it was compliant. Um, I think one of the things I mentioned in that video was that it's at, by modern gravel bike standards, you're running at least a 40 millimeter tire with like a lot of air in it. So that line of, you know, like it's hard to attribute the the compliance to the tires or the frame th these days. It's just a little bit harder to do, but nonetheless, it, it felt really nice. So I yeah. think I will say a properly designed aluminum frame is <laughs> underrated. <laughs> what is the, what, is it, what do their aluminum bikes cost? Are they? Frame set is 1500. That's uh, pretty frame, good. Yeah. Frame fork and seat post. Oh, dang. Hundred, yeah. So actually, I mean, I mean, yeah. This this the Sklar is more than that. <laughs> hmm. It's steel. What's yeah. the fork? Is it carbon or is it uh, aluminum as well? Carbon fork. Carbon fork. Yeah. And I mean, their their whole thing is they use high end aluminum. I'm, I have to bring my air quotes in. <laughs> um, high end aluminum, and that's maybe the only place where I I have a little bit of an issue because they they don't use sixty sixty one like most frames. They use a uh, 7005, which is just a different alloy. It's got more zinc in it, so it's a stronger aluminum. It's a stronger alloy, uh, which means theoretically they could use you know thinner walls and, and get away with reducing the weight a little bit. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I just I don't know that you you need high end aluminum. I think you can get away with good frame design and you know proper 
welding and, and stuff and still have it just as compliant and maybe not cost even as much. Yeah. I've got to watch that video. Super curious now. What was uh, tubing like? Were they su super oversized or did, did it look like a regular bike? <laughs> it's, it's oversized tubing. Um, it's butted, double butted okay. tubing. Um, yeah, it, it felt good. Like I wrote, I had to ride through, you have to ride through downtown Santa Monica just to get to Will Rogers State Park. Mm -hmm. And that's just a nightmare, just trying to ride through there, you know, like dodging traffic and cars and hopping curbs and potholes and stuff. So yeah. it like that section actually tested like kind of the, the comfort more than the fire road descent. So, <laughs> yeah. so it was fun. It was nice. Yeah. I do think um, <laughs> aluminum is making a little bit of a comeback. Like there's that bike shop in uh, Posadna. Uh, it's not a bike shop. The Beach Club, their house brand. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And they're coming out with their own aluminum um, performance gravel bike. And then I know Ron came out with the Aluma, Aluma Rith or something, like their aluminum ATB uh, oh. made by Frank the Welder. Um, so I think in some ways underrated, but slowly people are, are, are catching on because you do get, I, you can get like a lighter bike for without paying carbon bike money. Right. Yeah. Um, and to your point about like the tire size, I think, you know, back when there were aluminum bikes and road bikes and people were riding like 19 or 20 millimeter tires, mm -hmm. uh, definitely frame material became more apparent, but as the tires have gotten bigger, you know, it's, yeah, it's, not that big of an issue <laughs> yeah i think that's the story yeah yeah um well, let's see what 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 do the voice of the people say um da, 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 da. some material scientists in the chat yeah which here 6061c um is there so like if you if you want to look up the properties of a specific kind of alloy, is there like a a web page or a book that tells you you know like in what yeah. area it, it excels in? Well, it's I mean, there's nothing there's nothing to my knowledge that's specific to bikes, but you know, like for for any given material, you look at the oh boy, we'll get nerdy. You you look at the stress strain <laughs> curve, and then you look at the alloy, and you look at the tempering. And from that, you can gather if it's going to be a good material for like a bike frame. Um, gotcha. I'm pretending like I'm a material scientist, but I'm totally not. <laughs> I know the basics. But hey, I'm a literature major. I know shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. 7,005 is definitely less stiff than carbon fiber. Interesting. There you go. Yeah. Right. So, so there's, I, um, I don't want to, get on the soapbox here too much, but there's the, when people talk about strength and stiffness, like they're somehow like related, that always gets me because they're, they're not, they're two totally separate independent material properties. Right. Um, so when you see the word strength in like a, you know, whatever, or stiffness, I think the tendency is to kind of somehow connect them but they're not right. So it's like, so can, can a bike be stiff, but not strong? Totally. Or... Like a piece of, like a piece of glass, like stiffness is the resistance to deformation. Okay. Strength is the amount of stress that it takes to break a material. So like a rubber band, for instance, is in, is incredibly strong. Like you have to pull pretty hard to snap it, but it's mm -hmm. like the least stiff thing ever. Like you can just, you know, squish mm -hmm. it around. Piece of glass, on the other hand, right? It's it's very stiff. It's hard to bend a piece of glass, but you know, you know, punch it the wrong way and it'll just break. So uh, um, it's always a balance, I think, with frame materials, like finding that balance of stiffness versus strength. So what? How? What can like a temper add to the material? Oh, uh, <laughs> that's that's beyond me. <laughs> T six is um, but I think the T suffix uh has to do with the the temperature of the temp okay I don't know, someone in the chat will will tell us what it is right <laughs> <clears throat> and i don't exactly i forgot what what that does to the the properties of the material makes it expensive <laughs> <laughs> the higher the t the more the money 
<laughs> Direct correlation between the, the, the T's and the dollars. Um, <laughs> let's see what else other people have to say. Uh, yeah, there are great all, all road aluminum bikes between 1,000 and 1,500, much more accessible than, than carbon. Yeah, I think if I want to to go for like a really light performance oriented gravel bike, I'd probably buy an aluminum one before I'd buy a carbon one. Mm. Um, I think that's reasonable. Spend yeah. your money on wheels and and um, tires. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, here we go. I think Josh is uh, clearly maybe a material scientist. <laughs> Tempering material for heat treatment from T4 uh, to T is greater Did you than. Just copy and paste this. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. It's very yeah. specific. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it has to do with the heat treatment, right? <laughs> um, it increases the fatigue life. Yeah. So there's fatigue life, which is also an issue with. That's what ISO testing is, right? So when when bikes, bike components, and bike frames have to go through testing part of it is they just cycle it through 20,000 50,000 load cycles and see if it breaks because that's another material property is if you kind of if you load and unload a material too long it's called fatigue and then it'll fracture or break due to that repetitive motion so. yeah interesting all right so next next thing that's uh, underrated or overrated um we're going to st stick with the materials, and that is steel bikes. Let us know if you guys think steel bikes are over or underrated. We'll give you guys a second to, to populate the chat um, so I know if I should share my true opinions. <laughs> I think Rick validated Josh's statement. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Okay. Sure. All fatigue, right. So there is fatigue life with all materials, right? Yeah, that's that's kind of the issue. You have to make sure it'll last at least the life of the bike, I guess. Let's see. So we've got some over. Uh, Omar says steel is overrated. Drift advocate overrated. Uh, Richie says under. Uh, Husky Ops says quality steel underrated. Cheap steel overrated. <laughs> <clears throat> People do love their surlies. <laughs> um, Ben Ben here says it's correctly rated. Um, so it's kind of a mix. It's not like uniform. Yeah, I thought I figured this one would be a little bit spicy. Yeah, I, I do think it's very dependent on like which kind of discipline or, or segment <clears throat> of cycling you're you're coming from. Um, I think yeah. Husky Ops got it for me. What do you say? Quality, quality steel is underrated and cheap steel is overrated. I think that's... I think that's true. <laughs> hit, the, hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, it's, so what's, what's your take, Nolan? You're that's just it. Guessing. Like um, the, the vintage, the, the resto mod, the specialized hard rock over here. I found it on Craigslist. Um, you know, I bought it because, oh, everyone's doing vintage resto mods. And yeah. When I got it, it was very nostalgic. So, you know, I used to work on these bikes at the shop, but it you can tell just right away. Like this is single straight gauge, cheap feel, <laughs> heavy, and just like punches you in the feet and hands and yeah. the bottom. <laughs> That's a weird way to <laughs> phrase that. But yes, yeah, it's really stiff, really heavy. Um, and then of course you've got the um you got the Richie. Well, you can't see it. Well, yeah. the Outback, which isn't even like a high, like a high grade steel, but it's definitely nicer than the straight gauge stuff on the, um, the old specialized. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's triple butted, which just means the wall thickness changes at strategic locations. Um, you know, the frame was designed really well. So like a frame, like the Richie Outback feels really good, even though it's not like a super high quality steel. Mm -hmm. And then like a vintage, 90s um mountain bike the base model right just straight gauge is, is is very not i would say that's overrated right the old vintage specialized and maybe something like the richie's a bit underrated yeah 
I agree. Like I, I review a lot of steel bikes and whenever I get like a nice steel bike or a custom steel bike to review, usually the first comment is like, why does it cost three times more than my Surly? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's kind of hard. hard to yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, I think like you, the, like the, I reviewed it out, out back a couple years ago and that was like my first, you know, kind of step up from like just a Surly and mm -hmm. it felt different. You know, um, and if so, that was like, ooh, <laughs> I gotta get more of these uh, interesting custom steel bikes in and see what they're about. Yeah, isn't Laura's bread breadwinner steel? And yeah, is that bread... like a high grade? Is that a high grade steel? Or uh, I believe so. It, it costs a, like a high grade steel. <laughs> her, her bike is like um, her bike is really light. Every time I pick it up, I'm like, dang, you know. <laughs> Um, and I think we have like identical, uh, or at least like on par level wheels and everything, but just, yeah, it's, it's a nice bike hmm. and that's, that's kind of hard to communicate because if, you know, regular consumer that doesn't get a chance to try all these bikes looks at, you know, uh, a Surly, all city, not that there's anything wrong with them and, you know, like a higher end steel bike, they look the same. I mean, there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing in it that would kind of tell you otherwise. Yeah. Um, That's the trick, right? It's because the, what makes a high quality steel high quality is like, well, it's the, the material itself, which you can't see, right? Steel looks like steel. And then it's the budding profile. It's like a big, a big portion of it. Yeah. I was talking to Fergus from, from Richie and, like that's that's the whole thing. It's just the budding profile. Like where do you put the butts along the length of a tube so that it's flexible but not like noodly? That's like the whole secret sauce. Maybe that's maybe that's the marketing, but but I I, I bought it. <laughs> well the, the outback also has like a non-tapered head tube, which yeah. which I do think like does make a, a difference in terms of like the how how soft or, or stiff a front end can feel. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. Um. So no consensus. No consensus. Depends on where you're, you're at. If you're uh, if you ride a surly, it's probably <laughs> high end bikes or high end steel bikes are overrated. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing we're gonna talk about, we want you guys to chime in on, is uh, crank length. I've been going on this journey. You guys probably know what I'm going to say, but do you guys think crank length is over or underrated? Um, considering, <clears throat> if you will, that the bike, you know, or cycling is mostly a leg sport. And for the most part, we're only offered like five, you know, five millimeters of, of uh, choice in terms of most production crank lengths. So. Have, you, have you messed around with different crank lengths at all? 170 172 5 175 and yeah. only because that's <clears throat> they came on different bikes yeah which is probably the experience of, of mostly everybody right yeah how what's um what's your inseam short like 30 or less maybe 20 okay 28 to 30 i would guess i think you'd be yeah. a good candidate for for some shorter cranks like I think so I got a chance to, to test out those uh, fit cranks. I was like, ah, how much could like a centimeter feel like? Um, but it was a, it was a lot. <laughs> it's probably, yeah, I wanted most... to ask, yeah, before we talk about our opinions, I wanted to ask like, what is, there's a, there's definitely a big trend going towards shorter cranks, even in the mountain bike world, everyone's going shorter cranks. And I, I still, for the life of me, I haven't, I haven't fully understood what the mechanism is for why it's better. Like I get that it, the, the length should crank length should be like proportional to your, your leg length. Right. But I don't exactly understand the mechanism for why it feels better or why it is better. Yeah. So a lot of it is, uh, around not what the crank is doing when your foot's fully extended at the bottom of the stroke, but like the, physiological mechanics of when it's at the top of the stroke. Cause if you have a, let's say inappropriately long crank, um, you know, it could exacerbate like hip, hip impingement. Like if you, if you tend to rock on the saddle, um, moving to a shorter crank will kind of make it more stable. Um, 
like the way I like to visualize it is, you know, imagine like a, a track and field runner and, you know, when they're running over hurdles or like throwing their leg over, I've always kind of had that sensation, like climbing, like standing, like it's, there's like this dead spot at, um, when my foot's going over, it's because like, I'm kind of having to move my body around so I can get my leg over the, the crank. And with a shorter crank, you know, I feel like I can actually pedal circles. So it just feels a lot smoother. You know, I'm not bouncing over the, the saddle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was just, it was a big eye opener. So right away, like it just, you put a shorter crank on, it immediately felt better without. Oh yeah. You know, okay. It was, it wasn't like, you know, is there a difference? It's like, Oh, it, for, for me, it was pretty noticeable. Hmm. <clears throat> so uh, the Appleman cranks guy, he has, you know, these crank resources and, you know, a couple of calculators where you can figure out what your ideal crank length is. And, you know, there's a couple of different formulas. I think one is based on the length of your tibia and the other one's based on like a percentage of your inseam. Mm. Um, and depending on which calculator I use, it said either 155 or 160, oh, which wow. sounds like bananas right <laughs> coming from like 170s <laughs> yeah <clears throat> but since but, playing but with you, this your video you didn't try it you you tried to what was it 160 170 i tried a 175 down? and a 155 oh okay and did you like you like the 155 yes oh. like it like another thing that that you that i felt immediately was that um it was easier for me to bend forward and get into the drops because it, uh -huh. I didn't feel as if like my, my legs were moving up as high. Uh -huh. They're not like punching in the, in the chest. Yeah. Right? And, and apparently it's pretty standard practice for, for people that do TTs to move to a shorter crank for that discipline because mm -hmm. they can, you know, because their legs aren't going up so high, they can be, get more arrow and, and be forward. So that was another big difference. Um, doesn't yeah. your seat have to come up? Like if it you does. go shorter, your seat has to come up to comp like to yeah. compensate. Yeah, and if you want to keep the same uh cell to drop, then you have to raise raise or lower the handlebars as well. Mm -hmm. So there there are some changes that you have to do, but it's um you should re you should reach out to Appleman and see if you can mess with the fit cranks because I think you'll you'll be yeah, surprised. that's part of it too. Like how that's one of the hardest things to experiment with is just changing crank lengths. So having that there's like eight different like pedal <laughs> spindle holes or something. Yeah. Crank works crazy, but like it would be like a very useful tool. <laughs> I was considering doing like, okay, I'm just going to make a completely silly video and do like the hundred millimeter setting and the 175. Um, <clears throat> but I want to, I actually wanted to figure out what like a good crank length would be. And, and since mm. then, since the Appleman video, um, yeah, I ordered, uh, I, sw I swapped all my personal bikes to like 160. Like I thought oh. 155, although it recommended it, like it seemed too big of a jump, but 160, I could still feel uh, the benefits I was getting without, you know, I think like going too far. Interesting. I think okay. we're about the same. Yeah, we're about the same. So I've, I should definitely ex explore that option. <laughs> yeah, give, give them a give them a ping. Um, I almost I was almost gonna be like I should just send these to to you and, <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll I'll let them know that you'll you'll reach out to them. Um, okay. Let's see. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm gonna say that crank length has been underrated, or its importance has been underrated. Um, Maybe it's uh, not underrated or overrated. Maybe it's just overlooked. You know, that's true. People don't like consider it as an, even an option. Yeah. Cause I was like, a, conversely, I was trying to figure out why are cranks within that narrow, like 170, 175 range. And no one had a good answer <laughs> other than like, it's, that's, it's always been. Um, well, it's the same reason. It's probably the same reason that all the frame designs are based around like a 56 or a 58. Right. It's yeah. just this like <laughs> idealized persona of a cyclist. Right? Yeah. Um, I, I did some like looking on YouTube, watching other people's videos and like, uh, Matt thought that maybe it was a remnant from, you know, when bikes only had a single speed and you needed the leverage, um, Could and be, it's, yeah. you know, production, they, you're, you're forging the cranks. It's kind of big and heavy and expensive. So they're, they're not going to make a, 
these minuscule changes to to accommodate short people. <laughs> yeah. Um. <clears throat> okay. Uh. Let's see. Okay. So the the last topic. Do you want to introduce that one? Gravel suspension. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's that's kind of a broad topic. Um, I don't know how to narrow this down anymore. But I mean, a lot of the bikes. Like if you look at the this is a new giant bike, the the Revolt X, and a, and some other bikes are coming stock with a full on suspension fork. Oh, interesting. Um, forty millimeters of travel. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure for forty millimeters, but um, I mean, there's so many options. That's the thing. So gravel suspension is kind of this, like, I don't know, maybe it's too, too broad, but you've got, you know, stuff like the, the redshift shock stop stem, the, this Vecnum stem that I just reviewed for this morning's video, the Lauf, have you seen that Lauf <laughs> like, um, fork, the yeah. grid fork. I've seen that in person. It's, it's wild. Um, I've seen like the actuation of the, the wheel. Interesting. I haven't ridden that one, but I've ridden a lot of. A lot of the the gravel suspension solutions. Future shock. <laughs> future shock, right? <laughs> I have a weird relationship with future shock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what do you think? Because you've, um, you've tried a lot of the same solutions. Yeah. Let's see. All right. Let's let's have you guys uh, chime in about whether gravel suspension is over or underrated. Um, yeah, you know, I tend to, to like simpler bikes. So the more like moving parts kind of freaks me out. Um, so I think a, a shock would be just too much. Like it, I feel like if I'm riding in kind of the train where I think it necess necessitates a shock, I should probably be on a mountain bike <laughs> at that point. Um, so I think in, in some ways overrated. Uh, I do enjoy the things like the, the Redshift uh, sh shock stop as like something that takes a little bit of the edge off. You know, it's not, I don't think it's aspirations is to be like a full on shock, but just like maybe kill a little bit of buzz. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, one reason I like things like that is that it's not baked into the bike. So if you do find it, it does suck. You don't have to get like a brand new bike. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Where, where have you landed on, on gravel suspension? I go back and forth because part, like part of it really comes down to like people, I don't know. I, I think it, you've got to understand like your this motivational speech or something. You got to understand like yourself, <laughs> like where do you ride and what are your needs? That's preach it. it. That's where it should start. Um, if you're just riding mostly road with a little bit of fire road, you don't, you don't need suspension solution. I don't think. Um, if like uh, if you ride trails and and you occasionally, you know, find yourself on some single track and you're on a gravel bike, then it definitely helps. Like it's nice to have. Um, of course, like I'm sure, like I haven't read the the comments. I'm sure someone has already said just get an XC bike, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't have an XC bike, right? So I like to ride my gravel bike lots of different places, and if I decide I want to take this alternate route and, and go down some single track is nice to have the suspension. So yeah, it depends, I guess it all depends. I, I will say like, if I had to choose between either having a suspension stem or a suspension seat post, I'd rather get a seat post. <laughs> I can um, see yeah. I've actually, now that I think about it, like I've got the, the what's it called the cane creek ee -E wing uh or ee -E silk thing i love that thing <laughs> <laughs> mostly because you know when we're riding the chunky stuff here you know sometimes i 
don't see a rock and I forget to unweight and I get punched in the crotch. It totally absorbs that. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, it is nice. Not get punched in the crotch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a on a road ride, on the pavement ride, it feels a little bobby. Mm. But once we get on gravel, like it disappears and like I'd yeah. I think I'm gonna take it with me to Spain. I like it that much. <laughs> oh wow. Cool. Yeah, I mean, of course, the argument is just get bigger tires and fill them up less, right? So mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's totally valid if you have, if you run big wide tires. Um, like I found on the, on the Diverge, I run a 40, I think Paneracer is, it, is either 42 or 43 millimeter 700C. And I, I've been riding that with the, the Future Shock Delete kit, right? So I, I've removed the Future Shock entirely from the diverge and so that's rigid and uh, right. we rode um this this trail called chino hills it's called telegraph canyon it's in chino hills and on the way down i was <laughs> i was getting <laughs> pretty beat up yeah. um fully rigid and i think if i had like 48s on this tire though and I, I think that's a big difference between like a 43 millimeter and a 48 mm -hmm. um, like on the outback i run 48s at like less than 25 psi and that that actually does more than a 43 millimeter tire at lower pressures can do so yeah yeah it's all a balance but i like i'm slowly gravitating towards just less proprietary stuff and and keep it simple and if i can get away with just large volume tires i i would rather do that yeah um so talk, talk a little bit about the the future shock delete like what it is and and, and why it exists <laughs> <laughs> oh okay yeah well future like specialized bikes a few of their models um diverge um roubaix and then a couple of other ones they they have gone all in on the future shock which is this integrated you know pogo stick inside of the head <laughs> tube and so the whole thing is that it suspends the rider so just the handlebars go up and down and it works pretty well i actually like how it feels like it's a relatively well designed and it feels nice to ride but there is no, there's no exit strategy, right? If you don't like it or if your future shock breaks, um, I had a customer call because I, he, he thought I was a, affiliated with Specialized, but he said he, he called and his future shock broke apart on the way down a, a chunky descent and he injured himself like badly. Um, and oh, yeah, it's just, it's one of those things where you can't even touch the internals of the future shock because they won't let you because you void the warranty. So mm. the, the the FSD, as it were, so I don't want to get doing everything we can to not get <laughs> uh, sued by special. It's called the FSD. It stands for, you know, future shock delete. <laughs> it's an engineered rigid cartridge that replaces the entire future shock unit. So all the people who feel trapped with the technology at least have a way out. Um, and it weighs a lot less and it's a lot simpler to use. So it's just a solution for people with a future shock who don't want to have to sell their bikes or buy a replacement future shock. Right. Have, have this been selling Are people finding, finding it? The people are, um, when I did the video, there was like a large influx of orders. I mean, we've sold a lot of these, you know, I've, I've done a, a couple of three batches so far. Um, no, two, two batches so far. Yeah. And we're shipping them globally. People from all over the world have been, ordering them so there's clearly a need and and i think people appreciate having an option <laughs> right because there, there's no do they does future shock have a lockout capability at all or the the 2.0 version has a okay. knob which controls the damping yeah uh, and so you can lock it out but you can it's you can still move it but gotcha yeah um so new yeah. england really says you're not allowed to work on on future shock so <laughs> I mean, if you actually read the owner's manuals, like excl red exclamation points all over it, do not attempt to service the internals. Um, I mean, I, you can change the helper springs on, on say like the 1.5, but you can't open up the bottom because it's all roller bearings and I don't know what's going on in there. It's just a black hole. Yeah. yeah when, so, once you break the seal, the, the specialized police show up at your door. <laughs> 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 the season <and> desist. <laughs> right. Yeah. So 
All right. So uh, we're at hour and 10. We've got 260-ish people in the chat. Uh, that's pretty good. But you, pretty good. Yeah. It's um, a lot of people. Yeah. Let me let me know what you guys think of this format in the um, in the chat or in the the comments below after the video. Um, you know, I, I teased out a couple weeks ago that I'm looking for a more regular co-host. Uh, Nolan threw his hat in, uh, so maybe or at least like occasional. Like you know, we'll see how it goes on your. Your I, I feel like you're a lot busier than me. Like I don't have kids in the job. This is just... <laughs> yeah, but you're a content producing machine. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you guys like this uh, format, let us know. We'll come up with a, maybe we'll do another over or under um, or something else. That's not like such a, a blatant borrowing from Mr. Cade. <laughs> did you, did you get to chat with Francis at Sea Otter? I saw him at least three times in passing, but never got the chance to introduce myself. Yeah. But you'll seem like it. You'll be able to see him. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like he was at the booth, like right when we entered. Um, uh, yeah, it was a totally nice guy. Um, so, yeah. Very okay. Cool. I'm going to take us home. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to Nolan's channel, uh, definitely go visit the bike sauce. Um, he's, he's got the science. <laughs> <laughs> I've been labeled a nerdier version of you uh, a number of times. So, that's, that's good. I'll take it as a compliment. Yeah, that's good. Like I, I don't do math, so it's it's good that you exist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, keep the supple side down. <laughs>